Cool, so hi, I'm Ilya Meritz. Um, nice to meet all of you. Um, just give me a little bit of a sense of who I'm talking to. Raise your hand if you are primarily interested in radio, if that's the reason that you're here. Okay, and if journalism is the reason that you're here. And public radio journalism, specifically. Great, okay, so I'm talking to all the right people. That's really excellent. Um, I actually didn't know exactly what I wanted to say, so I prepared some notes, so I'm just gonna consult this. Um, but I'm basically here to tell you about what I do, which is a really awesome career for shy people who like people, because my job is basically talking to lots of people, and um, because it's my job, I have to do it, so I do do it, and um, I actually kind of love it. But if you are just a busybody or a loudmouth who can listen, you also might be cut up for a career in journalism. Um, so, basically, my, my plan, I'll talk a little bit about what I do. Are we able to play audio? From, do you remember I sent you those two audio lines? Are we able to play those? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about what I do, and I'll play like excerpts of some stuff that I've done. Um, talk a little bit about why I do it and how I got here, and then I'll just open it up to discussion. So, um, what I do, I am a business reporter for WNYC. WNYC is the largest public radio station in, arguably the largest public radio station in the NPR system, uh, in the largest city anyway. And so for me that means um, I'm the only business reporter, so I'm covering employment, real estate, Wall Street, I've covered trials, um, workings of government, uh, you know, I've asked questions of the mayor and the governor at press conferences, I've interviewed the attorney general, the state attorney general, but still it's an important job. Um, <laughs> and um, even got to interview Mark Ruffalo twice, actually. Um, <laughs> I can't think of any other famous people, but there are some. Um, and basically what I do every day is create a variety of kind of different products. Uh, we have news spots, news features, and then two ways. And those are sort of the three principal products that reporters at our station do. News spots, I actually don't have one set up for you, uh, but a news spot is like 45 seconds of like a typical NPR newscast where uh, a reporter will just share the news of the day, and it's very condensed, and it can be a little bit dry, but we try to keep it interesting because it is, after all, news of the day. Um, two ways are interviews with a host, and those can be a lot of fun to do, especially if they're live, and there's, um, there's the feeling that anything could happen. I tend to script my two ways, uh, and we'll play one of those that, um, that is scripted. Uh, but the goal is to make it sound spontaneous, to make it sound like a conversation that uh, the listener at home is also taking part in. And then sort of the holy grail of public radio reporters. Holy grail is sort of the wrong word because we do them all the time and the holy grail is a rare thing. But the, <laughs> the, the thing that we tend to revere most is the news feature, you know, where you go deep into some subject and you get a lot of interesting natural sound and you find really unusual voices and link them together in interesting ways. So, um, if we're set up to do it, Avery, let's play from the two-way about the village voice. And um, let's just play like a minute or so of it. Like This is WNYC, I'm Amy Eddings. An iconic 57-year-old New York City weekly paper co-founded by the late journalist Norman Mailer has new owners. The Village Voice is being sold, along with all of its affiliated free arts weeklies to a Denver-based group of investors, but the deal excludes the online classified site Backpage.com. Its listings have drawn fire for promoting prostitution. Here to help parse the story is WNYC's Ilya Meritz. Hey, Ilya. Hi. So why is The Voice being sold? I know it's been having economic troubles, but what's going on here? The Voice is being sold, in essence, because it had a problem roommate. Now, basically, The Voice and 12 other alt-weeklies shared a corporate umbrella with the listings website back, Backpage.com, which you just mentioned. To continue that roommate metaphor, Backpage.com did pay its share of the rent on time, but it was not a happy living situation. And the reason is that while Backpage could help you do wholesome things like find a guitar teacher or maybe sell a boat, it also allegedly is a forum for unscrupulous people to sell sex with minors. New York Times columnist Nick Kristoff wrote about this in his columns. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and since last year, Backpage has been the target of dozens of lawsuits over human trafficking. 
In April, Goldman Sachs sold its stake in Village Voice Media. The following month, the City Council passed a resolution demanding that Backpage remove its, its adult classified section. And in a web post today, The Voice's now former owners, Michael Lacey and Jim Larkin, wrote that, quote, Backpage's battles are an enormous distraction to publishers, editors, and readers of Village Voice Media. So the two of them are selling the newspapers to concentrate on defending Backpage.com in court. So Lacey and Larkin are keeping Backpage.com, but they are selling the newspaper part. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I think the mon in newspapers, the money has long been in listings, and uh, you draw your own conclusions based on that. Yeah. Well, can The Voice survive without Backpage.com? The, the new owners definitely have a big challenge. They now have 13 newspapers, but they've lost this lucrative listing service that Backpage provided. And I, I have the paper edition of The Voice with me here, Amy, if you want to look at it. The classified section is um, its just a page and a half long. Yeah, so it's all driven by the uh, online content. Right. So fixing the finances will be one difficulty, and in recent years The Voice has also lost Many of the bylines that made it the voice, Wayne Bear, Tom Robbins, does the paper, as you hold it up to me, still matter? The paper still breaks important stories, like Graham Raymond's pieces on police corruption in Bedford Stuyvesant, which was also very memorably done in a version in This American Life. But circulation is down by about 100,000 since 2006. Wow. Yeah. Uh, this afternoon I went to Cooper Square, where The Voice is published, and asked New Yorkers what The Voice means to them. Here's a sample of what I heard. That's where I used to find out everything I used to do since I graduated college. Concerts, bands, everything like that. Um, I don't read it, but I grew up in Greenwich Village, so <laughs> I would see it around all the time. I know what it means to the community. Um, I don't read it, so not too much. <laughs> Never picked it up? No. How come? Um, I don't know. I don't really read paper, I guess. Uh, that was Nicole Lehman, Lucas like Purple, and Catherine Reeves, the young people. So that's a two-way, and two ways, um, sorry, so that's a, um, a two-way, and two-ways are really, really fun because, um, because you do have that conversational back and forth, and actually you're able to play quite a bit of tape. Um, usually I would try to have tape a little bit further up, because tape, like those people um, that you heard, is just totally ear candy just being out on the street, but uh, because that story had a lot of news that we sort of had to get through, I put, put that on top. Um, if you're ready to play like about a minute or 90 seconds of the feature as well, um, just to set this up, this is a feature about sneakers and um, how did I get turned on to this story? A, a source at a store that sold used cell phones was like, you gotta talk to this guy called Tony, because he, he does some cell phones, but he really does sneakers. And I was like, what do you mean sneakers? He was like, just meet him. And uh, basically what Tony is, is a sneaker reseller. So he stands online on really, really long lines, like sometimes for more than a day, to get sneakers and then flip them. And um, he's just an amazing character. And I, I knew pretty quickly when I met him that he would be a kind of a worthwhile story. So let's hear like a little bit of that. People who love sneakers will converge this weekend on Baruch College for SneakerCon. It's a chance for fans to exchange the latest news about the hottest sneakers as well as add to their collections. Sneaker love began in the 1980s when Air Jordans and Air Force Ones were all the rage. And that love has only grown. WNYC Zillia Merritt reports now some sneaker fans have discovered a profitable niche buying and then quickly reselling shoes to other fans. Some Friday night, you're wandering through Times Square, maybe you see a scene like this. Amid the swirl of human traffic and pulsing lights, a line of people waiting patiently, a really long line. They're sitting in camping chairs, drinking big gulp sodas, and getting blank stares. This is crazy. I don't get this. Well, good luck with your hunts. But you see people here. This guy, called Lewis, gets it. They are fiends, man. I call them Jordan's children. Lewis works for Foot Locker, patrolling the line. Because tonight, at midnight, the Air Jordan Playoff 12 goes on sale. Almost 30 years after the first Jordans hit the market, they're still wildly popular. Many people are buying for themselves, but not Tony Holmes, a 25-year-old wearing dark Gucci glasses. Holmes is a reseller. He buys shoes and flips them for a living. He's retail for what? 160 after tax, 173, basically 175. And what do you think you can resell them for? 250 to 300 off the back. A neat 70% profit. 
if Holmes gets the price he wants. There's um, so yeah, that's an example of a feature, and um, a lot of features are kind of newsier than that one was. I kind of had to work to convince my editor. It was kind of like, Eric Jordan, this wasn't that like in the 80s? And it was in the 80s, but in a way the news was kind of like, actually this is still going on, it's in plain sight, and, um, and it's particularly interesting since Foot Locker kind of works with these guys. I mean, you heard you, they have that guy controlling the line, so it's not, it's not a secret to the sneaker industry. Um, all right, why I do this. Um, at the time that I was graduating Wesleyan in, in 1999, I really had no idea what I was going to do for work. I came from the kind of family that did not pressure the children in that family to like become a cardiologist or name what they were going to be. Um, I, at some point I wanted to be like an astrologer or an architect. Um, or other things that began with A, but um, but I had worked a little bit on the Argus, which also begins with A, and uh, and I knew that I liked journalism. I wasn't sure that I had the right personality for it because uh, I, I thought of myself as kind of a shy person. Um, but so I guess when I kind of ran through the different the different possibilities in my head, the only thing that seemed really exciting to me was like NPR journalism, radio journalism, like those were the things that like, yeah, I could feel in my stomach. I want to do that. I should do that. Um, yeah, I was good. I was thinking of playing the beginning of, oh good, you have that. Great. And then so, as I've stayed in radio journalism longer, I would say the reason that I do it is because of its unique power to tell stories, like in a way that can't be done on television and can't be done in print. Uh, I want to play like maybe 90 seconds of this really awesome piece by Elise Spiegel. She uh, is a former This American Life reporter. She now works at NPR. She reports a lot on psychology, family life. Things that honestly I would probably hate to report on, but she brings them to life in the most magical way. So I hope that you enjoy this clip as much as I do. Oh. Thank you, player. <laughs> Now they're gonna like be like shop with the NPR store. Yeah. <laughs> Support for NPR comes from America's Natural Gas Alliance, whose members are participating in an online registry providing drilling information to the public. <laughs> 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 It's morning edition from NPR News. Good morning, I'm Steve Inske. Renee Montaigne is off at the start of this holiday week. She's back with you on Thanksgiving Day, so set a place for her if you don't mind. While I'm away on Thanksgiving Day with my family in Indiana. Now, all through this Thanksgiving week, we're going to report on your siblings, or maybe not precisely your siblings, but those with brothers and sisters may recognize something in the stories to come. Today in Your Health, we'll look at a mystery of siblings. Many people wonder how, with the same parents, the same family, siblings often seem so different. NPR's Elise Spiegel introduces us to two brothers who say they share almost nothing except love and a last name. The fight happened a long time ago, when they were both still in school. But for both Tom and Eric Hebel, the fight was a defining event, the kind of family story they trot out for new acquaintances because it conveys something important about who they are. Eric Hebel begins. He had come home from college, and we were at home, uh, and we were just having one of these, you know, 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night conversations. They talked sports, they talked school. Then the conversation turned to money. Tom's position was that money was inconsequential. And I just said it wasn't that important. I said I could just, you know, take out the dollar bill and just burn it, and that wouldn't really matter. And he said, but you wouldn't do that. To Eric, the idea of burning money was just stupid. You know, the, a, a dollar bill is, is very valuable. Even if it's only a one dollar bill, it, it, you can do stuff with it. And he said, no, it's not worth anything at all. It's just paper. And to prove his point, Tom offered a demonstration. I took out a dollar bill in my mom's kitchen and uh, lit it on fire and burned it. And he literally kind of freaked out. Eric Hebel. I'm just, you know, freaking out. I, I was probably being held back. So there they were. Two brothers of roughly the same height and weight, with the same hair color and the same last name. But as they looked across the table from one another, Tom Hebel says, what they saw was unrecognizable. I think he could... 
Okay, so that to me is just like a masterpiece of an opening for the piece. I mean, look at how she brings you right into the moment of that fight. They're not recounting the fight in the past tense. You feel like you're in it when you hear them recounting it and the way that she juxtaposed their voices. Um, I think, personally, it's just totally masterful. It also sets up very neatly the question, which is, why are siblings different? Which is such a broad question. Um, I would personally feel some trepidation about even attempting to answer it, but it is something that psychologists think about, and Elise Spiegel, the reporter on that story, found um, and spoke with quite a few people who have, I think, three or four different theories about why siblings are different. Totally different kind of story. Yeah, you could do it, in print, you could do it in print, but I don't think it would be captivating in that way. Um, and I don't think I would read like an online version of that story ever. It's just a story that's actually made, made for radio. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got here and then I'll open it up for questions, which is uh, probably what I would prefer and I think what you guys would prefer. Um, my first attempt to get into public radio was the summer after I graduated Wesleyan and it was a complete failure. I, um, somebody I knew suggested that I work for a show called The Connection, which was in Boston at WBUR. I don't think it exists anymore. It was kind of like a like mid-morning news talk show. And, um, you know, they were booking guests on current events, and the host, Christopher Lydon, would interview them. And they had these very kind of um, ferocious kind of topic <laughs> meetings. And I, I could never quite get like a word in edgewise. Um, and the one segment that I sort of got to like really master produce that summer just like went really, really poorly. The guest that I had booked, who seemed so good on the phone, like turned out to be really bad on the actual program. And Mary, I think her name was Mary McGrath, the producer of the program, was like kind of angry about it, but didn't like really have time to like show her anger even, which was also kind of weird. Um, and so I sort of set that aside. I was like, okay, well, maybe that's not the thing for me. Um, but because I didn't know what I wanted to do after college, I had sort of set myself up with this German language scholarship. If you, like Avery and me, study German, um, you should know that there are a lot of scholarships to, to study more German. It's like a really awesome thing. Um, and so I was in Berlin that year, and another friend was like, you know, why don't you like work at the university radio station? And, um, and I did, and they gave me free reign to actually like write and produce my own stories and to go out into the city and interview lots of people. And I was like, this is so fun, this is amazing. Um, and that really kind of set me on the path. Um, ended up back in New York City, where I'm from, and working at my local NPR station, <clears throat> WNYC, at a morning mid-morning news talk program. Uh, at a certain point, I realized that I didn't want to be the behind the scenes guy. I wanted to do things that were my own composition, in my own name, um, and be a reporter. Um, the path to being a reporter anywhere is not so simple, but in public radio, which is a pretty small world, it's, uh, it's particularly sort of not clear. It's really kind of like right person, right time. Um, you know, just, just being there, kind of always being open. Um, as it happened, I, I kind of quit WNYC, did a bunch of things that everybody talked about. I went to the Czech Republic, where my mom is from, and went to Washington, and kind of worked at NPR, and learned that system a little bit. And then I ended up back at WNYC. Um, and I mean, I have to say, I love my job. It can be a little bit of a gilded cage at times, because it's such a, a rare job that you, you couldn't find it anywhere else. So I, to some extent, I tolerate, um, you know, there's always the, risk of um, just sort of being satisfied with like where you are, how you are, and I want to always grow and push myself forward. Uh, but basically it's an awesome place to be, um, and I guess I'll throw it open for questions. Anyone? Avery? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about um, the voice, and I don't know and what was involved in training a radio voice, or if there's a specific kind of sound that WNYC or public radio likes to cultivate? There probably is. I mean, I always meet people at parties who are like, oh, you have that voice, and I'm like, don't say that. Um, because there, there's no training, there's no indoctrination, at least for me. And 
Um, I, I don't think I have like a radio voice particularly or a particularly beautiful voice. And I don't think Elise Spiegel has a particularly beautiful voice. She sounds like, you know, that girl who lives on your hall. Um, I, I like that about NPR. Um, I, although I kind of actually would like a little bit of voice training, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And you, absent real voice training, you sort of train yourself um, and just learn to get relaxed in front of a microphone. Um, you know, little tricks that we'll do. Sometimes if I'm feeling particularly lethargic, I, before tracking a piece, I'll actually get up and do jumping jacks. Like, uh, the engineers actually know me as like the guy who does jumping jacks, but it does get you just kind of hyped up, you know? Or like, even just like a slap to the cheek. Um, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Because you're, a you're acting, you know, you wrote these words, but the words are not dead on the page. You have to bring them to life. And the hardest trick, actually, is to bring your own words to life. It's weird, because you wrote them, and you wrote them very intentionally, and you wrote them very carefully. But when you're reading them, you don't want to be reading them very intentionally and very carefully. You want to be reading them just like they really matter. Um, and that's, uh, that's just part of the craft of reading. Anybody else? Are you a fan of podcasts? Yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I don't listen to a lot of pure podcasts like that aren't radio shows. Um, I do listen to the Gab Fest, which is um, from Slate, which is kind of politics oriented. And the New Yorker also does a politics um, podcast that I like. Um, do you have any recommendations? <laughs> I, I mean, I use it a lot to catch up on shows that I like, right, which I think a lot of us do. I mean, I'm kind of curious how many people here listen to radio, like radio itself, like more than an hour a week. Oh, okay, that's great. Awesome. Radio is alive as well. Because, but the rest of you, I hope, are listening to lots of podcasts. Um, yeah, I worry about that a little bit because, like, my stories are not part of any podcast. They're just on the local news. So people who don't get it that way won't get it at all. So, so yeah, that's the question. How much control do you have over your stories, like from their conception to editing them and producing them? You know, a friend of mine said recently that the reason that nobody wants to be an editor in public radio is because the reporters have too much power as compared to print. And I think that's sort of true because in a print story, the byline is there, but many readers never even really notice that byline. Um, in radio, you can't help but have your personality all over it, actually, because we convey so much with our voices, which is a long way of saying I have a lot of control. <laughs> um, I often get assignments from uh, from one or other one or other of the editors at WNYC, but um, you know the choice is mine how to tackle it, and the question always is like, what's going to be my in? Because um, you know, radio is a, a linear medium. You can always decide that it's more important to feed your cat or do the dishes or study or whatever it is that you want to do. So people are always looking, you have to think that people are always looking for a reason to turn off the radio and you have to always not give them a reason to turn off the radio. So you must always find an interesting way in. Um, which I realize is not exactly the answer to your question, but whether the idea for a story comes from me or whether it comes from my editor, I sort of own the hook and I own the job of selling the story. That's how I see it. And do you produce it too? I occasionally, yeah. Like if I'm working a holiday, um, we might not have any engineers, I'll just, and, um, and there's an interesting story, I want to do like a two minute featurette or something, I'll just produce it myself. Um, so a lot of reporters aren't that agile on it or don't like to do that, um, but I do. I think it's a lot of fun to actually, you know, do the mix yourself. I like that. Um, I've heard Ira Glass talk on and on about how important it is to start a piece with, with an anecdote, or you know, have, like just an anecdote can provide you an interesting way into a story. Um, so when, when you craft stories, is it more of um, you have to look and look and look, and then you know, ev eventually something will stick out about the way you know when you're staring at a blank page to write the script, or is it all along like with Tony and the sneakers, like did you? know immediately like what stood out about that guy what was gonna 
taste? No, but you're always thinking about it when you're out doing your interviews. Like, you must think about it. And interviewing is really difficult, or it's an interesting challenge because you want to informationally sort of get everything out there that you might want to use in your piece. But then the most critical thing actually is sort of the the unintentional comment, right? They're going to be talking to you about estate taxes or something, you know, because I have a business. But then if the if the tax consultant you're in, uh, interviewing happens to be like, actually, you know, when my mom died, I couldn't handle it. And I'm like, oh, really? Like, who handled your estate taxes? Um, and I'm like, oh, you know, I asked this other... And like, all of a sudden that leads to an interesting story that like weirdly kind of helps you tell your story. Um, it's that concrete kind of thing that often kind of provides the hook. Um, the story I'm working on now has to do with reading Twitter and Facebook for um, for insights into the stock market, and it's not a piece that I, it's not a subject that I like that much because it's kind of slippery. It's very amorphous. Um, but the guy that I interviewed, one of the guys I interviewed, did a study of uh, Facebook likes uh, for major corporations, and. We started talking about high school, and I was like, well, were you popular in high school? Because his study is sort of all about measuring the popularity of McDonald's and Abercrombie and & Fitch and Coca-Cola and all these American corporations. He was like, no, I was a wallflower. I'm like, oh, okay. And we start talking about like what it's like to be popular or not popular in high school and how similar and not similar that is to the popularity of companies. Um, weirdly, like you have to often start in a slightly adjacent place to what you actually want to talk about. What's um, well, hold on. <laughs> okay, yeah. How long does the story take? To do? Like, yeah. Uh, it really depends. I mean, I wish I did more quick turnaround stories because I love doing day of stories, but um, maybe because of my beat, like my stories tend to sort of take a while. Yeah. It really varies. It could be like a day, it could be like months, depending on how intensively I'm working. Because I'm usually juggling a few things at a time. So what would a normal work day or work work week be like for you? I mean, they all vary. I mean, I can tell you today, I started the day at Google, um, which uh, is hosting Cornell. Do you know that Cornell is developing like a tech campus in New York City? Oh, you guys are nodding your heads. Um, okay, well, they're developing a tech campus in New York City. It's sort of a big deal in New York. And Google leased them some space in their building on 8th Avenue. And they gave us a briefing that I can't actually tell you about, it's embargoed, but they gave us a briefing to do with their plans. I don't think they would mind me saying that. Um, and so I spent like two hours there with a bunch of journalists kind of being briefed and thinking about how I'm gonna spin this into a story. Then I went into work, did an edit with my editor on um, on that sent that Facebook like story. And then I pretty much got the train up here actually. So every day varies, but I try to be out of the office like a few days a week because it's really bad to sit at a com computer terminal all the time. It's soul killing and it's really contrary to the spirit of journalism. You mentioned briefings and I think about stories like sort of about journalism that I've read where it's sort of all about spinning the briefings and it's this like weird meta process. Do you feel like you have to do that a lot or do you get to spend more time like getting right at well, I don't cover politics, so that's a mercy. Um, yeah, I mean, you always, you learn to always ask yourself, what is the motivation of the person I'm speaking with? And if you're good at your job, you will have the person you're speaking with forget what your motivation is, and they'll just treat you as a friend. You're not a friend. You're a journalist. Um, you want them to open up to you, however, and to tell you as much as possible, and as many interesting things as possible. Um, so, of course, you can never record people and not tell them. But you can just say at the beginning, I, I always do, I'm recording now. And then you have a conversation and you do your best to have them, help them forget that. Because having a microphone in front of your face, especially if somebody else is holding it, is like actually a really jarring experience. Um, and so everybody has a different way of being relatable, but you, you try to be relatable. <clears throat> Do you have a question or like go-to question that most always bring up the fascinating side of someone? A really good question for people is like, when is the moment when? 
you could apply that to pretty much anything. And politicians won't be as good on that, but like any real person who like realizes something in their life, you know, like it, it was it was when I was in the shower. Like that is so relatable, you know. Um, the basic questions are really important. Why did you do this? <laughs> um, and it's really important to ask questions in the most basic way possible and to not offer them answers. You know, to not say, did you do it because, you know, did you kill your baby because you're a bad person or because you're really <laughs> desperate? Or, I've never asked that question, but um, don't offer them answers. Like, like that, you don't know what they're gonna answer and they might surprise you. Like never take away their chance to surprise you. Offer them the chance to surprise you. And if you think about questions that way, like you, you could get lucky. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you were next. Yeah, you, uh, the black hair. Um, in that vein, how did you get into the reporting of system? It was what was available. <laughs> um, it was what was available. Um, I had been sort of like reading the business pages for a while and liked it because um, it seemed interesting and like something that I didn't understand and I wanted to learn more about. I really love it now because it's such a diverse beat. I mean, I cover schools, I cover media, I cover, you know, retail, real estate. I mean, anything, anything that you could have a dollar sign in. And a lot of my stories don't even include numbers or dollar amounts. Um, that would be different if you're talking to a business reporter at like Fortune or Business Week, um, or maybe even a very business-oriented podcast. But because we're sort of general general listener oriented, it's it's like fantastic. I mean, I wanted to do, you know, I've done like fashion week stories just because I wanted to go to, not just because I wanted to go to fashion shows, but you know, partly because I just wanted to go to fashion shows. I was like, why do these exist? I don't get it, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, once you start like looking for business, you see it everywhere. Um, and I don't think every beat is like that. Have you ever had any negative fallout from one of your stories that someone took issue with how they came across and editing their I'm trying to think of a good anecdote for you. Yes, uh, is the answer. Um, there have been times I've gotten facts wrong or slightly wrong. More often slightly wrong than wrong. Or they didn't like my take on a thing or felt that I didn't tell the whole story of something. Um, Yeah, okay, here's one. Um, I did, sort of before the whole natural gas thing exploded, I mean, it was probably beginning to explode, but a lot of people hadn't sort of heard about it. Um, I, I teamed up with ProPublica, do you know them? This investigative journalism nonprofit. So one of their reporters, Abram Lustgarten and I, were really curious like how New York State was gonna handle fracking. And we went and we interviewed this state official I, fracking wasn't even a hot button issue at the time, right? And um, Bradfield is his name, and he's still working there. And he he came across as kind of clueless in response to some of our questions. And he was clearly a smart person with a master's degree, but he really didn't seem to have fully thought through the issues, at least based on the tape. And maybe the tape would have sounded a little different from uh, from what was written in a Brahms piece, but I don't think it did. I mean, I think he seemed like a smart person who really hadn't thought through the issues, and the listener came away with the sense of like, whoa, New York State is like going at 100 miles per hour towards natural gas drilling, and our officials can't answer the most basic questions about what we're gonna do with the wastewater, how we're gonna clean up the sites, what the penalties are, if things go wrong, all of it. Um, so I guess that was a little bit of like a self-serving way to answer the question because it was sort of what journalists, journalists like to tell those kinds of stories. But people in the department were very upset and they didn't return my calls for a long time and they felt that it was very unfair. And maybe, maybe it was, I, um, I don't think it was, but, uh, but they made the argument. So earlier you commented that radio isn't dead. Right? And so, if this is now 2022, and we're sitting here, and you're giving a discussion to us, what is your job? I hope I'm still a reporter. <laughs> um, radio's not dead. When I started at WMIC, we had, I think, under 200 employees, and now we have more than 300. 
our news year when I started was like three reporters, and now we have like probably 12 plus like five other part timers, freelancers, sort of ers. So the medium, I, I don't know what the reason is exactly why things have worked out well for radio in the time that I've been working there, but I, I feel very fortunate about that. How does the medium change? I mean, I hope people just get more creative. Um, I hope there's more radio labs and more This American Lives. Um, you know, to get to those, you probably have to have 10 failures, but I hope because people are enthused about radio that there's more funding for pilot projects and, and people with crazy dreams. I could probably toss out three or four ideas of you know shows that should exist or maybe someone ought to try but don't now exist. Um, uh, I don't have a good answer for that question. What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where it's going. You know, what's the trajectory? If you think about where radio was a hundred years ago and where radio is today, you know, where do you think it'll be if you extrapolate the line out ten years? Is it something that's so stable and so a part of American culture that it's something that will never really die away? Or is it something that ultimately, you know, shifts and changes so easily, you know? Or does it change enough that it kind of dies off in podcasts and, you know, iTunes starts to take, you know, control and the public, you know, in the sort of libertarian, you know, view of the world is really about for the individual controlling radio content as opposed to, you know, national conglomerates controlling it. I mean, who knows? I feel like, let's see what happens in, you know, November. <laughs> I want to know, like, when when the All Things Considered music is gonna change. I hope it doesn't because I love it, but, um, but I don't like the Morning Edition music as much, so they can change that if they like. Um, anybody else? Um, do, you, do you ever listen to like commercial radio news and sort of uh, like think about how you do different things differently than, like, than what they do on like CBS or whatever? Hardly ever. Um, sometimes when I'm like driving in Pennsylvania, um, like ABC News Network comes on, and it, I mean, they're just very talk like this. Um, but we don't really, we don't really compare ourselves to them, and that's a, maybe a little bit unfortunate because every industry should sort of have its competition. But um, we see ourselves more like print in a lot of ways than like commercial radio, and I think we basically are more like print in terms of story selection and the way that we approach stories. What do you think best prepared you for what you're doing now? I mean, with journalism, you just have to do it. So, um, I will say that um, it was really great for me at the university radio station in Berlin to kind of be like on a station that not a lot of people listen to. Um, and uh, just sort of going out into the city and talking to a lot of people. And then again in Prague, at that point, um, you just have to make a lot of mistakes. Radio is a craft, and I recommend that everybody like do a craft. When I, you know, my dad is a camera, <laughs> this is a very meandering answer, my dad is a cameraman, and I didn't think for a long time about like, oh, funny, he like works with pictures, I work with sound. But it is, camera is sort of the corollary for what I do. And um, what I really admire about my dad and what I think informs me about what he does is that um, you get better with time. You're always improving, right? You're always looking at somebody else's work critically and sort of admiring it if it's good or thinking about what you might borrow. Um, and so I think the best preparation is to do it and then to like really pay attention to the people who are doing it. And then it sort of starts to come to you intuitively. So what do you think is the most like challenging or frustrating part of your job? I mean, our newsroom is going through a lot of kind of manage management changes. Um, and I don't sort of want to talk out of turn. I mean, I'll just say that inertia is a problem with any job and um, public radio world is kind of static, like reporters don't get, their beats aren't switched that much, and the editors that you're working with doesn't get switched that much, and yet you want to be creative and have original ideas and like try things that haven't been tried before. But you'd be amazed like how 
what short of a time you could be in an organization, and that sort of starts to diminish. I was talking with some of these guys from the board before we came here, and I can't remember which one of you was saying that you have a show where somebody reads the like missed connections on Craigslist. Like, yeah. Oh, awesome. Like, I want to. Can I listen to that sometime? Is that like on the web somewhere? Yeah. Okay. The fall break episode coming out soon. What's it called? Misconnections. Misconnections. <laughs> okay, so like maybe that's not like the most like creative invention. Somebody else already did misconnections on Craigslist, but like this guy adapted it for radio, and it probably makes awesome radio. And he probably reads it in a really wry voice or a really whatever voice. It's hard because they're actually really like they're from Hartford, and there's something particularly sad about. Misconnection in the middle of Connecticut. <laughs> and it's, just, and it's all these like gay men in the stop and shops. And I was gonna say Starbucks, no? No, there are no Starbucks here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it was, it's like, it's trippy. Sorry. I had this idea once for a show where people would, it would just be like an answering machine and the show would be called like, um, what was gonna be the name of the show? Like, it was something to the effect of like, oh, this crazy thing just happened to me. And people would just, it would just be like a dedicated answering machine line. And people would like tell a true New York story. Of like I was on the subway platform and this man like took out a block of cheese and just started eating it. You know, whatever. Like, <laughs> because New York, that happens all the time. Weird things like that happen all the time in New York. It was just like curated as like some cool little thing. Well, you know, to make that happen in like a 300 person organization is like not that easy. And I, I suggested it once and I never really followed up on the idea. And I don't know that I really want to develop my time and my like personal political capital for that. But actually, it is really important to do those things. So. You have a question? Yeah. Uh, how, how did you learn to do radio production that sounds like good radio? It's not really that difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you just you screw up a couple times, and then you just like learn how to hold the mic. You know, I mean, and you strengthen like whatever muscles like do that. Because sometimes you do have to do that for like twenty minutes, and it's like really <laughs> awful. But you you try to get there early so that you can just go like that instead of like that. So. But how about like mixing? Um. Right. Um. Actually, some of that I worked at all things considered was really great. The work was sort of mindless, but assembly line work. But it was really fulfilling. Basically. Um, I was mixing reporter pieces, and so they would come to me with a script and sound, and I wasn't even an engineer, I was supervising the engineer's mix. So, you know, I would do a layup where you'd have all the sound pieces where they should be, and then like the engineer would hit play, and I would say, okay, start to sneak in some ambi, start to sneak in some ambi, bring it up, bring it up, okay, back down, and um, that was cool, I mean, it was a lot of fun, it's, it's not like what I was born to do, like at all, but, um, it was that kind of like very fulfilling, like slightly mindless work that like you just get that skill down. Um, I mean, there's a lot of programs and they're all kind of different. We use David now, so if I get onto like Audacity or Pro Tools or something, like I don't know what to do anymore, which is sort of bad. But um, uh, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Good. Who else? Um, when you're preparing for uh, an interview, how, how much like do you like plan out the questions, or what, what's your process for preparing for an interview? Um, I do think about it in advance. Sometimes like I'll be on the subway and I'll catch myself. I'll be like, oh, I could be reading the newspaper, but it's like, no, you should really prepare for this interview. Because even if you think you know a subject, um, you have to think about how the person you're interviewing is going to take those questions and what questions are most likely to elucidate a good response. Um, it's very easy to forget to ask basic questions because like you've learned all about the subject fracking or the stock market or whatever it is and you're like, you want to like go in and like be like oh I'm an expert too like you want like forget that you want to go in and be a play be as dumb as possible and just be like what's this all about like that that is like the best opening question that you could possibly like when in doubt but then you need once you've done that then you have to have some good specific questions. You want to identify the tension, you want to identify like conflicts, things that might keep the person up at night, things that like will have changed or like adaptations that they will have made to whatever it is that they're doing. And then save the really confrontational questions for the end, but do ask them. Um, 
and there's a right way to ask confrontational questions. I mean, you can even say, you know, I must tell you I feel a little uncomfortable asking, but I do have to ask, why did you do this? Or, you know, this thing happened, everybody knows about it, I want to hear your side of it. Um, and I actually love asking delicate questions, because if you proceed from the point of view that there's a right way to ask any delicate question, like you will find it, and then you'll be like, yes, yes, I asked that question. Say that you think of the right way to ask them questions, you like go meet them beforehand. We almost always talk on the phone beforehand. Um, um, but how do you maybe phrase a question that will get that will like open them up to what they? I mean, it really depends. I did a story about non. One of the stories I'm proudest of was about. Um, 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund recipients, and these were the people who lived. They lost like a wife or a son or a daughter, but they lived and they got like a million dollars because of what the person who died did, and there was a specific way that it was calculated. And I, I walked into each of those interviews like really knowing that I had to be like super respectful, but also like knowing that I had to ask how much money did you get and what did you do with it? And that, that was the underlying fundamental question. And I just tried to sort of warn them what the story's about, remind them that I'm a business reporter, and um, sort of talk about the public service aspect of it, because they'd all been through this very painful process where you didn't just get the money, you had to apply, you had to produce pay stubs, for somebody who died, who you loved very much. And so, I guess in that instance, I found once they walked me through the process, it wasn't such a big deal to say what number came out at the end. That, that's not like saying how much do you pay in rent or how much money do you make. It just means like, what's the number that the machine spit out at the end. Um, and all three of the people who I interviewed for that story were just you know, amazing human beings and told fascinating stories. Do you have a take on the NPR liberal bias for being representative of the nation as a whole controversy? It's one of those things that makes me really annoyed to hear people whine about. And I don't know. I haven't thought about it. It's not true. I have thought about it a lot. I've thought about it <laughs> mainly pertaining to programs on our station, which I'm closer to, rather than to NPR. Yeah. And I'm not really comfortable sort of talking about it in this kind of setting, but if you want to talk about it with me afterwards, I'd be happy to. Um, the other thing, actually, on interviews that um, is a really important distinction to make is really there's sort of two kinds. One is a straight up interview, as we've been talking about, with a person that you might arrange in advance. The other is what we call Vox Pop, Vox Populi, Man on the Street. And those are actually really important to reporting. I found them to be really, really helpful on a story. I did a story once about like a bank that had failed in New Jersey, and my editor on that story was like, you have to go to this place and hang out. And I'm like, but it's like a desolate corner in Elizabeth, New Jersey, there's not gonna be anybody there. But like, sure enough, there was a check cashers across the way, and the guy in the check cashers, like, he had heard what had happened there. In fact, I think he'd gotten like a loan from them. And, um, that might actually not be the purest example of box pop, but sort of going out onto the streets and just finding people there rather than calling experts at Wesleyan University or whatever institution is really, really excellent. There's like almost no substitute for, hi, my name is Ilya Marantz. I'm a reporter with Public Radio. Do you have a second? Because I want to ask you about ice cream. Winter is coming. I know people eat less ice cream, but I'm really curious like what you're eating right now. And uh, very often people will talk with you, um, and it's a lot. And it's a lot of fun. And if they say yes, if they don't seem into it, you let them go immediately because they will continue to resist you. If they say yes and they're kind of interesting, then you have to keep it going. Maybe all you wanted to hear was like chocolate chip, but um, if they tell you that like they just discovered chocolate chip and in their country there is no chocolate chip because it's against their religion, all of a sudden you found this much more interesting thing. It happens all the time. So like when you find like an interesting person, just like ride it out as long as possible. Constantly be thinking of follow-up questions um, because if they're giving you good material, they will keep giving you good material. And then you come back and you're like, that was awesome. So.
Anybody else? Have you ever stayed in contact with anyone you've interviewed, or is that completely I haven't very much. Um, there are people I talk to. Uh, there's like a few kind of economists who study New York City who I talk to a lot. Um, but never anyone on the street who's like, wow, we should hang out sometime. I started to make a friend once from the story. <laughs> <laughs> and then another time I went to the Armory Art Fair for like a different story and like a girl, I started talking to a girl there and we became friends, but she wasn't, as, she wasn't anybody I interviewed in my story. No, I almost never do. I don't, I don't think I ever have. Not really. I would, I would like to. <laughs> I would like to. Do you have a dream interview, like someone you really, really would love to interview? Um, no, but um, one time Madeline Albright was in our studios for an interview with somebody, and my mom was check born, and like, I just like freaked out. I ran out of the news reading meeting and I like ran over here. I was like, oh my god, Madeline Albright. Um, but there's, is there's like something that I want to ask Madeline Albright now? I just wanted to be like, oh my god, you're Madeline Albright. Um, <laughs> uh, no, sorry, do you? No, not particularly. Does anybody here have a dream interview? Come on. Sarah Taylor. What would you ask her? I would ask her anything. <laughs> I would just love to listen to what she has to say in response to anything I ask her. Is it the content or more her verbal style? Um, content. <laughs> Definitely content. <laughs> Anybody else? Do you remember you? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> the historical, I think that you say, like, tell me, what's the real story? <laughs> <laughs> Did you marry that woman? <laughs> 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 I mean, like anybody who I read about in the opens of the New York Times, I usually am like, damn, I wish I could have interviewed them, you know, like who, scientists who are like refugees and, you know, I don't know, just like amazing people who have complicated lives. Like any of those people, most of them I haven't heard of, you know, the trick is to like find them before they die. <laughs> If I could interview anybody, he's just probably like relatives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe a couple key historical figures. Hitler's mother, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> are, uh, are you familiar with the like Reddit Ask Me Anything format? My friend told me I need to get on that. Uh, Do I? Uh, yeah. I guess I could explain it quick, but I was just sort of curious on your thoughts on it. It's, uh, Reddit, Reddit is basically uh, comments get upvoted and downvoted. So, uh, if somebody has something that is popular, like question, then that is the question that rises to the top. And uh, and ask me anything is a platform for people who either have like interesting backstories or are like celebrities or have just for whatever reason, um, like people are, might be interested in asking them questions. And I know the president did it. Did it? Did, who else has done it? Uh, I mean, everybody from like Louis C.K. to like, um, that, that's not, uh, like Neil Gaiman, I think, yeah, has done one. Uh, the, 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 dream, the dream interviewee from Reddit is always Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, <laughs> he should be know. easy. He's like a media... He does it like three times. <laughs> friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, I'm curious sort of uh, how, how you... Feel about the difference between like like crowdsourcing and you I guess kind of almost like what we're doing now, yeah, like having like a, uh, kind of like a a bunch of people asking a person a question as opposed to one person sitting down and asking. Like, I mean, I really am enjoying what we're doing now. Um, and at the Cornell thing, actually, this doesn't happen to me that much, but it was a, you know, it was a briefing on their plans for this university, and there were probably like I don't know six or ten other reporters there, and. We were kind of piggybacking on each other's questions, and that was cool. If you go to Mayor Bloomberg, and you know he's doing like six questions for reporters, all of your questions are probably going to be kind of different, and he's sort of so seasoned that it's not going to be like as interesting, maybe. Um, but yeah, I like I like asking questions with lots of other people. But I'm curious, do good questions rise to the top on Reddit? Uh, sometimes I would say uh, sometimes it's just like the wittiest question or. 
or somebody who like makes a plea that they're like just have this random ex chance to talk to somebody from, from like I read last of them recently and somebody one of the top comments was like you need to come to our screening of of, of the movie because our, our we have a scrappy film place it's like you know like anyway. sometimes those right yeah I, yeah I mean questions are weird because um, like I've been to the New Yorker festival a few times are you guys familiar like they'll have like their writers or famous actors or whatever and Last weekend, I was at one where people asked actually fantastic questions. But very often, you go to these kind of forums, for uh, and people they don't they just like want to comment. They don't actually have a question, and so like there is like a little bit of an art to like learning a question. And if you really admire someone, like it's not sufficient to tell them that you really admire whatever it was. Like you should come up with something that more that you could learn about them that you haven't yet digested. Um, anyone can do it. Is that a question? No. Yes. Do, do, do interviewers ever try to turn the table on you or ask questions back? Or? Yeah, I've had people get defensive, sure. Um, um, that's great, as far as I'm concerned. That produces great tape. I mean, th this witnesses everything, right? So um, I just have to think sort of quick enough to be like, OK, uh, sure, I'll try to answer your question. but. You know, I, we you agreed to an interview with me where I would ask the question. You know, did but you, if, if I mean if tension arises, that's awesome. Did you listen to the most recent radio lab episode? <coughs> I don't they, think so. They, well, they were interviewing. Um, uh, uh, I think it was a mom, um, uh, like grandfather and granddaughter pair, and about like this horrible, possibly biochemical warfare and. But they, basically, they, they believe, um, and they do believe that they were they're being attacked with like this weird chemical warfare thing. That there's lots of evidence that suggests it's not, and it's a very touchy personal subject. And it, the interview ended with the grandfather and the granddaughter both crying and like uh, really upset because of um, Robert Fuller's question. And just um, it was really interesting because they they didn't edit out the like part where they're like you're being an asshole. Um, but just, you know, because what the difference, I guess for me, the difference between text and phrases is you can hear people's emotional tones. And so, how, and if, you know, I feel like content wise, it's easier to like draw a line or it's like, well, they lied to me, so I'm not going to include that. But how do you, how do you like fact check them, fact check emotions so you can still make your point without like hiding the fact behind their emotional kind of yeah, responses? Okay, I'm going to give like, Sort of an answer, and then you can like tell me if it's like. Um, I have sort of re I realized as I've been doing this longer, it's actually it makes really good tape if you hear me. It can make really good tape if you hear me actually asking the question, like in the village voice thing, where she said, "No, not really." And I said, "Ever, right?" And like that's there. I'm standing in for the listener. He's like, "This girl not really, ever, not really listens, reads the village voice like ever." Um, so that can be really good, um, and it also just sort of naturally adds like a little bit more of an emotional dimension because there's the incredulity, right? And the, I probably wouldn't express incredulity like when tr tracking a, or like a totally recorded piece. Um, emotion is good. I mean, it should be there. I I got to share a black car with Eric Schneiderman, who's the Attorney General of New York, like, uh, oh, like 11 months ago. This is really exciting. It's so, like, a powerful job. Elliot Spencer and Andrew Cuomo had that job before, and he was possibly going to make some news to do with, like, mortgages. And he was really kind of emotionally flat. Um, but it, I think it was who he is. I mean, he's a very sincere, kind of earnest person. And I don't know what I could have done better. I, I would love to have seen what Robert Crawlwich would have done with him in that car. But Robert Crowell, which is a different person, like you you leverage what you have. Like I'm not zany like Robert. Um, I'm not as zany as Robert anyway. So um, in the 9-11 piece, one of the characters is a mom who lost her son, who was I think about 19. And at a certain point she kind of broke down and there's this like, 
probably like 12 seconds of just like breathing. And the engineer took it out of the piece and it like lost all of its emotional power. There was so much in that silence. And there was so much in hearing her regain her footing in that piece. She's like, okay, I can do it, we're fine. And she came back and actually sounded quite bright, you know, and you can see like what a range of emotions a human being can go through in a really short time. And that's like such a powerful reminder, even if you've never lost somebody in that way, you're like, yeah, I feel like happy and despondent like 10 times a day, you know? That's why, again, yeah, that's why I love radio. What else? What other shows do you guys do that are like peculiar and interesting, like reading um, The Missed Connection? <laughs> well, um, so um, I'm Garden Connected at 30 a.m. on some nights, but on other nights, there's this really great, um, forget, I feel like I heard about it on um, too much, too, uh, ben, uh, Benjamin Walker's Too Much Information. It's this like website that takes ambient music from SoundCloud and mixes it with um, police radio <laughs> called I'm Listening To. And so we have one with a middle fix, police radio. Um, radio scanner. Radio scanner um, in that vein. Um, and like, what's like a beautiful moment that happened? I have it, well, it's live, so I've never, I've never really wake at 2.30 a.m. Anybody? Anybody heard it? I, I can tell you our most our most popular show <laughs> is um, the show run by uh, um, a character named uh, Commander Elian, uh, who um, like the little Cuban boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, no, no, not Elian. <laughs> like, Commander Elian, like like, 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 oh, okay. like it's, 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 it's the cosmic eye is the name of the show, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this it, it's a it's an awesome show. It, it, like it goes back and forth between like sort of meditative ambient music. And uh, his like reporting and interviews and discussions about um, sightings of extraterrestrials, and um, and, he, and, he, and like like he is like a big shot in the the like extraterrestrial sighting community. Ashtar. Um, Commander Ashtar. Yeah, is the being. Yeah, Ashtar Command Base. Ashtar. I'm not quite familiar with the whole vocabulary of the show, uh, but that's like Sunday morning kind of prime time. Uh, uh, is 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 the show that. Uh, is it possible to listen to it in any way other than like sort of snickering? I mean, I like a lot of like the the people who like like more people listen to his show very seriously and earnestly than listen to any other show. <laughs>